From, from this talk, how would you say this should affect our everyday living? Well, a couple of things to start with. One is that I think it's very important that we work out day by day what it is that keeps our vision fresh. And I would say that that's part of the importance of prayer and meditation regularly. Keep the vision fresh. Make sure you don't take it for granted. And that's really starting as basically as I can get, because spiritual life doesn't mean, as I said, cultivating feelings or having wonderful mystical experiences, very nice if you do, but it begins with trying, trying to be honest before God about yourself, bringing all you are before God. Second thing is, I suppose, Asking yourself, again, regularly, daily, where and how can I cross a few frontiers to somebody different? Where can I allow my world to be opened up a bit? And that may mean, well, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, when my daughter was in secondary school, um, in a reasonably well-to-do kind of secondary school. The school, I think very creditably, organized a scheme which sent volunteer students from their school to a school in a very deprived area to support them in some of the work they did, for example, in setting up debating societies, drawing people out. But the great thing was that somebody like my daughter, from a relatively comfortable background, well, I don't know, I hope she'd think that, um, would go into a, a not very comfortable environment and have her world opened up. So there's a, you know, the question, what can I do regularly to make sure that I have those challenges? Just a couple of things there. Um, what, 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 what do you feel um, our uh, current society is at, um, at, at the current moment today? Um, how far have, have we got to go? I think it's a very mixed picture. I think that there are some aspects of our society which, not least social media, I'll come back to that in a moment, some aspects which bring us closer to each other, which allow us to experience and discover connections we hadn't imagined, and yet there is so much else that seems to reinforce division. There is the spiraling inequality in our society and in our world, the widening gap between wealthy and not so wealthy. There's the fact that in our world generally, not just in our own society, there's at the moment an unprecedented number of refugees, people who have been driven from their homes by violence and conflict. So our world is one in which we're, you know, we're quite away from this. And Sadly, those things can increase the suspicion and the anxiety that I talked about, the sense of being threatened. So we have a long way to go. That's why I think it's quite important that people of faith stand together and speak together and act together about these things. As teenagers, we feel that we have a lot of pressure uh, on us from society and social media, so what do you advise us to do in order to keep ourselves safe from the perils of the internet? First thing I want to say to that is that sadly there are not going to be completely safe places. We're all exposed to this all the time. And that's why we have to go inside to discover the roots of our own strength and our vision. And it's back to what I said at the beginning. The daily discipline that brings us before God and that asks God to keep us honest and clear, clear-eyed. And I think one of the most important ways in which we can keep vision alive for ourselves is also making sure that we talk to our friends about these things and not necessarily on Twitter. You know, we talk face to face. I'm not one of those people who think that social media represents the end of the world. It really doesn't. But it doesn't substitute for conversation. 
and the warmth, the extra dimension that comes from seeing somebody else's face, which is not quite the same as FaceTime. <laughs> so I'd say, make sure that you, well, let me again use an old Christian image, that you unveil your face before God and you unveil your face before other people, before your friends and your neighbours. And that will, I think, keep you connected to some of those inner resources that will help you resist the pressures around the trivialising, the, the gossip, the demeaning, the, all those things which make a lot of our social currency pretty worrying. So go in and link up with real people. What can you suggest in enhancing trust in building interfaith relations between communities? Friendship has a great deal to do with it. Um, when I'm going to do a name drop now. Some uh, years ago, I remember a conversation with the Prime Minister <laughs> um, and the question arising, you know, how do you react to a, a religiously divided society? I said, actually, I don't believe this is a religiously divided society. I believe it's a diverse society. A divided society is one in which it's really difficult, if not impossible, to make friends across frontiers. A diverse society is one in which it's possible and imperative to make friends. And when I look at a lot of local communities and see examples of work together for the service of the community, the, some of what's been done in the Near Neighbours programme some of what's been done in places like Birmingham and Burnley in common witness and service. I think that's where people discover that the diversity around them is a resource, not a menace. But it comes when some of that face-to-face -face relationship develops, I think. And you realize that the other person wants so much of what you want. They want emotional security, a sense of purpose, a sense of dignity. And that's, that's where it comes alive. And that mustn't just happen at the leadership level. It has to happen, well, with all of you. I just wanted to ask if you thought that if living in such a diverse society promotes spirituality and harmony between people from different backgrounds? Well, not automatically, of course, because when you encounter diversity, as I've said, that can make you anxious, and that's the opposite of being spiritual. But it does seem to me that when you do live in a very diverse and rich and complex environment, you have the opportunity of growing spiritually in a very rare way. How should I put it? It seems to me that the more diverse communities and people you encounter, the more you can say, God gives richly. God doesn't just give me people like me, but people who are not like me, which means that I, I grow more fully because of that. So I think diversity can be a positive thing. I'm not saying it has to be because we're human, you know, we, we back away sometimes from the challenge. But you talked about embracing the now, but many of the issues of society have long-term causes and long-term solutions. So how do you th uh, reconcile these com competing timelines? That's a, a most interesting point, and you put your finger on something that's crucial here. When I talk about trying to relate to the here and now, I hope that doesn't mean that we stop thinking about the long term. What I'm suggesting is we, we oppose living in the here and now to living in the world of fantasy. But living properly in the here and now is our best way, of course, of tackling the long term. Take issues around climate and environment. You know, the, the great long-term crisis, in a way. 
I think we begin to respond adequately to that when we recognize that in the here and now, we are seeing already signs that many people want to ignore. And again, we ask for our eyes to be open to see more clearly what's going on here and now, so that we respond more adequately tomorrow and the day after. But sometimes, you know, there's, there is a way of saying, well, the problems are so big and so long term that I won't, won't bother about doing anything today. I'll just think of the long term, the big picture. And that's another temptation. So long term effectiveness begins in here and now attention. And I often quote here something that was said by the Christian reformer, Martin Luther. He said, if I knew the world was going to end tomorrow, I would plant a tree. That sounds absurd, but I think what he meant was, planting trees is a good thing. And if it's a good thing, it's a good thing, even if the world's going to end tomorrow. And that, that's, I think, a, a good sense of the here and now. Um, what are your views regarding how social media has affected young minds? I said a moment ago that I don't feel social media developments are the end of the world, and I don't think that the younger generation is being turned into a, a sort of mutant population of screen-obsessed zombies. Some newspapers seem to think so, but I, I'm more optimistic. But there are a couple of things we have to really keep an eye out for with social media. One I've hinted at already, and that is it's sometimes a lot easier to say things through social media that we wouldn't say to another human being's face. And that's a way of backing off, a way of escaping and denying. Keep an eye out for that. Even exchanging emails. You know, I had an email this morning from a colleague about a committee meeting, um, which was expressed in very, very um, offensive terms. And I thought, he wouldn't say that to me. But on email, it's fine. And I think, hey, just be careful for that. Because that's, you know, that's one of the ways in which, again, we are led to deny the here and now, the reality. Second thing about social media, in the widest possible sense, is that we are drowned in information, or what's supposed to be information. We often find it very difficult to discern what's really important for us to know and what isn't. Sometimes we can think that just knowing things makes a difference. It's not just a social media problem. But I just wonder whether that ocean of information and stimulus pushed at us all the time is quite what our brains are meant to cope with. Are we expected to be aware of more than we can really be seriously humanly aware of? I don't quite know the answer, but it's the kind of question I want to put here about the problems of social media, the challenges they throw up. You said we live in an interdependent world where we all rely on each other and we all should depend on each other. Uh, as we see the catastrophes unfolding in the Central African Republic, the sectarian divisions, killings and the refugees driven from their homes in Syria, uh, and even issues more close to home here like climate change and poverty, should people of faith get involved in politics or, or, or any, uh, how can I put it, social change to try, try and address these issues. Uh, do you think that people, in, people of faith are, are actually fairly uh, and uh, proportionally represented in politics? Thank you much. Should people of faith get involved in politics? Absolutely yes. Um, I think the, the mistake that sometimes made and the resistance that sometimes meets is to do with any suggestion that our faith mandates voting in a certain way, as if you know, faith backed one set of policies of one party rather than another. I don't think there's, you know, there's ever going to be any political party that's completely in accord with 
religious teachings or any religious teaching completely in accord with a political manifesto. They're different sorts of things. But, but we are citizens, and as citizens, we exercise the power and the liberty we have as citizens to make a difference. One of the ways, not the only way, but one of the ways to do that is through political processes. Um, Russell Brand may think it's a silly idea to vote, but I'm afraid I disagree rather strongly with him about that. I think politics is too important to be left to professional politicians. And we need that kind of groundswell of community pressure and vision and activism to keep things moving. So, yes. I wanted to, you spoke a lot about how diversity plays a massive role within a city and how it's important to acknowledge that diversity. Um, on that point, what is your opinion on um, the way the government is currently uh, acting towards um, immigrants, most notably from Bulgaria and Romania, and more recently with the immigration bill and how it's creating this level of um, sectarianism, if, if you will, and also hatred towards um, immigrants, and you can even go as far as I can, hatred towards diversity within the city, or incoming diversity. I think this is one area where it's extremely difficult for many people in this country to have honest discussions, and it, it's, it's a shambles. I was deeply shocked by those advertisements that appeared briefly, basically saying, if you're an illegal migrant, go home. I'm very anxious indeed about some of the language that's used around sort of penal sanctions in this area. And of course the hysteria that was whipped up at the beginning of the year, as you say, about Eastern European migrants was utterly extraordinary. Again, the assumption, these are people who are after what we've got. Sharing makes us weaker. You know, that's the bottom line. But in this area, we are, of course, up against a very deeply entrenched set of public views, quite widely shared, it seems, which are easily swayed towards fear. Politicians depend on those people's votes, and very often, whether they're left or right, they'll go along with those. And that's one of the really sad things about our climate at the moment. And one of the things I'd like to, to see, I'd like more than anything, to see changed, that people fall over each other to be you know, more harsh on migrants than the next person. The fact is, this is a society built on migration. I'm a Welshman. And of course, the first great migrant problem in the UK was the arrival of the English. <laughs> um, <clears throat> And some Welsh people feel rather strongly about that still. <laughs> We've always had that sense of new communities arriving, modifying the kind of society we are, we move on together. And while there are perfectly reasonable questions to ask about what is a manageable level of migration, and perfectly reasonable questions to ask about um, the risks of draining talent from other societies to, to work here. And while there are real problems about the, you know, the attractions of a low-wage economy to immigrants, none of that ought to make us buy into this language of, as I say, deep anxiety and insecurity. So you're right to say there's, there's a problem there. And I wish we could be a bit more honest and a bit more generous and a bit more, you know, positive overall about this. Very interesting recent book, if anybody picks it up, by Paul Collier, which is called Exodus. And it's an analysis of patterns of migration. And it does dissolve some of the myths about what immigrants do to the host society, while also raising some quite important bigger questions. So it is possible to begin a slightly more sensible discussion. I'm really interested uh, having led the whole Anglican Communion in some way, how do we begin to lead 
uh, one small group of people in the church or in uh, whatever group we're in, in this direction of seeing other people in a different way. I got thoroughly fed up with being asked about leadership in my ten years as Archbishop, because I was usually being asked by people who thought I wasn't exercising it, so naturally I got a bit cross. But one of the things I sometimes said was, leadership is basically, well, Christian leadership, let's say, is about whatever it is that brings about a Christ-shaped difference. Now, translate that into the terms of other religious communities. Religious leadership is what brings about the kind of difference that reflects more clearly the fundamental vision of your faith. So, it's not always throwing your weight around. It's not always giving yourself neat and simple targets that will look good. It's bound in with this task of trying to be honest day by day and honestly trying to bring about a difference that, as I say, reflects a bit more the basic value. So in very small communities, as in very large ones, it means trying to help people ask themselves some questions. I mentioned in the talk that I thought one of the most important spiritual questions was, what is my selfishness stopping me seeing? Or what are my fears stopping me seeing? But I think part of leadership is just being alongside people while they're asking that question and trying to insist gently but firmly that it's a question that can't be avoided. What are you not seeing? And what's stopping you seeing it? And that's the beginning of change, I think. A lot more that could be said, but that's where I'd start. I wanted to ask you a question which I'm afraid comes back once again to politics and leadership. And I wondered if you could give us some recommendations for practical mechanisms for influencing political engagement on an interfaith basis and gaining traction around some of those really big issues, such as challenging the rise of the far right and racism. Thank you. Years ago when I was working in Wales as a bishop and the general election came along, the local churches in South Wales decided to make a major thing of organising public meetings for all parliamentary candidates, where there would be free questioning, not just a you know, presentation of views. I think that it's still true that faith communities, ideally acting together, can be a very good pressure point for getting parliamentary candidates to come and talk, answer questions candidly in front of live audiences. <laughs> It's a small thing, but I, I don't think it's trivial, because often our politicians are shielded from the risks and difficulties of face-to-face -face questioning like that. So that's one thing. Um, in London itself, I've always been very impressed by the work of London citizens and the citizens organizing movement, because that's all about identifying local needs and mobilizing grassroots communities, and it's very much inter interwoven in areas, some areas, with faith groups. So that's, that's certainly something to be done. I think also it's, it's important just for groups of different faiths to, to get together, not just for, for campaigning, but also for reflection on their context, so that people from different groups meet simply to say, well, you know, I think this is the issue that's coming up. I think this is where the shoe is pinching for this particular neighbourhood. Just to reflect, even before you think of activism. I think all those things are, are part of, of an answer. Because when you have that um, discernment and perspective, then maybe you can more effectively advocate in public. And there's, I suppose there's also you know, the level at which leadership works, um, there have been moments in the last 10, 12 years where I think it's been helpful that some religious leaders have been able to act and speak together on issues of public concern. There have been times in the past few years when 
people of other faiths have said to me or to other bishops in the House of Lords, you know, we're expecting you to speak for all of us, not just for yourselves. So there's, there's a lot there. We all live in patriarchal societies. I mean, we can't deny that. And religions, particularly the Abrahamic ones, um, are manipulated by men, particularly heterosexual men. And as you've said, religion is part of the solution. Would you agree that religion needs to be feminized or even made queer so that trust and compassion and human dignity become central to our society? One of the problems of the Abrahamic religions, I suppose, is not just that they are, so to speak, responsible for patriarchy, but they all can come to birth in societies with quite strong patriarchal assumptions. And even those things in, those, in the Abrahamic religions that pull against pure patriarchalism can be swamped very easily by a patriarchal environment. And it becomes a sort of vicious circle. Religious patriarchy reinforces social patriarchy, which reinforces religious patriarchy, and so on. So I think you're right. We need the voices of those other presences, whether we're talking about female voices or LGBT voices, to say, well, just don't assume that there is only one way of talking about humanity or about God, which is sort of top-down patriarchal. There's only one way of talking. There are conversations to be opened up here. So, yeah, it's a real critical question whose importance I don't minimize. And I think that one of the things which the Abrahamic religions need to go on doing, and they're all doing it in different ways, I think, in bits and corners around the place. What are those bits of our distinctive religious language and heritage which actually pull against patriarchy, which dethrone the all-powerful male father? And each one has some elements there which actually give some seed for self-criticism. So I think that's, that's a little bit of an answer, I hope. How can us youth maintain our spirituality in the society that we live in today? Well, my answer to this is going to be really boring. Um, you need to say your prayers every day. <laughs> um, the daily discipline. As I said earlier, the daily attempt to be honest before God. The daily decision to give time for God to clarify your mind a bit. As people from yet another religious tradition say, time for the surface of the water to settle and become calm so that it can mirror God. That's, that's how we do it. And there's no alternative, unfortunately, to, to doing it, to deciding to do it day after day. But as I hinted a little while ago, you get by with a little help from your friends. <laughs> you, know, you, you need to be with people who, who are serious about it as you are. Not in an exclusive way, huddling together, as I said, for warmth, but knowing that you will need some encouragement. And when I've taken confirmation services in the church, often for young people who are making a commitment to faith, one of the things I've almost always said in sermons is, make sure you've got some friends who are serious about this, and all of the rest of you in this congregation, bear in mind this young person making a commitment is going to need your support. We can't do it on our own. And communities need to be really serious and careful about nurturing commitment in their younger members. And we all need to take responsibility for ourselves with that.